Hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Dwayne Butcher of Lean Frontiers and I'll serve as your host today. Uh, today's webinar is part of the Energize Your Journey webinar series that we're doing along with the Association for Manufacturing Excellence. Uh, this series highlights several of the presenters that you'll meet at the annual AME conference. Whether that takes place in Toronto, October 26th through the 30th, or whether that happens virtually. You can certainly stay tuned as AME shares information on how things play out. Uh, however things do play out, I can tell you this, that uh, the AME conference and the AME community has long meant a great deal to not only Lean Frontiers, but me personally. And uh, it's certainly a great time of learning and networking with uh, one of the world's largest lean conferences and that endorsement mind you comes from a guy who runs my own conferences uh, i think that highly of it just a couple points of logistics before we get started uh, today's short presentation is being recorded so you look for an email shortly after we finish with a link to view the on-demand recording of the session and please do share this with others in your organization um, due to the short nature of our webinar, we will not be fielding questions. Uh, however, if you do have questions, our presenter will make her email address uh, available and you can contact her directly. So with that said, let me introduce uh, our presenter for today, Katie Anderson. Um, Katie launched KBJ Anderson Consulting in 2013 to help individuals and organizations improve their businesses uh, through effective problem solving and leadership skills. She brings 20 years of improvement experience across a range of industries, including healthcare, manufacturing, academia, biotech, government, startups, and business. And uh, most noteworthy, Katie, uh, is that you are a new author of a book titled Learning to Lead and Leaning, uh, Leading to Learn. Uh, and I understand, Katie, that you work closely with Mr. Yoshino uh, to capture some of his lessons uh, during his time at Toyota. So I'm hoping maybe we'll hear a little bit about that during your presentation. Yes, absolutely. So, perfect. So Katie, for now, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to you and I'll talk to you at the end. Sounds great. Thanks. Thanks, Dwayne. And uh, apologies, everyone, for the video. Um, Dwayne and I were having some difficulties getting all the, vid the video hooked up. So you'll just be hearing my voice today. But uh, hopefully you'll be able to, well, you get a sense of who I am here and um, take, get some takeaways from my forthcoming book, Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn, as Duane mentioned. And this was built uh, or created really in partnership with my mentor and good friend now, Mr. Asao Yoshino, who worked at Toyota for over 40 years and in fact was John Shook's manager uh, at the time of the GM Toyota NUMI collaboration, joint venture in the 1980s. So I'll tell you more about this. I'm just gonna share some highlights about my own practices, as well as some uh, insights and stories that I learned from working closely with Mr. Yoshino since we met five years ago. And I've really helped uh, come to some, some clarity on my own purpose, that, which is about helping people around the world live and lead with intention. And I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about what that concept of intention means for me here and how that can relate to you as you think about the three sort of functions and roles that you can take to be a more intentional people-centered leader. Uh, so a little throwback to five, just over five years ago. So I'm based in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's where I, where I grew up and where I've been living for many, many years, although I have lived in five other countries outside of the US. This is a photo from uh, just a few months after my family moved to Japan for 18 months. We had this wonderful opportunity with, with my husband's job. And I had just met Mr. Yoshino about six months before at a conference. And he had given me his business card and said, come to Nagoya and I will take you to Toyota City. We'll go to one of the, the factories, tour around, and we can spend the day together. This is at the end of the day as John and I were about to get back on the Shinkansen bullet train to head back to Tokyo. And I really thought it was going to be a once in, this was a once in a lifetime opportunity. And little did I know that uh, how close Mr. Yoshino and I would become and that I would be, have the wonderful honor to help bring his stories and reflections of 40 years at Toyota uh, to, to, into a book together for you. So that's a little bit about the history. 
And this is a photo of us from just in January. I was out in Tokyo, or sorry, in Japan, well, in Tokyo and Nagoya and all around to prepare for the Japan study trips that I had intended to lead in May and again in October. But of course, um, given the pandemic, those would have to be post postponed till later. Um, but we did have an opportunity to get together and get this picture together. In fact, my hair, I wish you could see it, has not been cut since then, so it's quite a bit longer. Um, but Mr. Yoshino, through this process of working on the book together, uh, has told me many times about how the um, how our process of reflection, of Hansei, of looking back and me asking questions and him, him digging a little bit deeper into his memories, has helped him even learn more and sort of see things in his life from a new angle. And that's been a great honor for me to not only help him learn and relearn about his life, but also about how to uh, take his stories, looking at the past, and then help you connect them uh, and be inspired with how you can be uh, thinking about your future in the, the people-centered learning cultures that you want to develop in your companies. And I've really come to believe that reflection is not just the, be uh, the beginning, but the end of learning. So often we think of the plan, do, study, adjust cycle as starting with, with plan and do, and we get caught in this plan, do, plan, do uh, cycle. But really reflection is where we need to start. So looking at the past, at what has happened, and then making adjustments for the future. Uh, I also wish I could show you uh, my wonderful Daruma collection. It's um, in the room that I'm in here. This is these dolls from Japan, where if you have a goal, you fill in the left eye of the Daruma. And it is about a visual representation of having a goal, but also this concept of perseverance. The dolls are weighted at the bottom, so they're paper mache, and if they get knocked down, they, they topple over, but kind of write themselves up again. And there's a Japanese proverb, fall down seven times, get up eight, that I've really uh, taken to heart, especially in these times of um, challenges and in writing a book about we're always gonna encounter challenges and difficulties along the way, but how do we persevere? How do we get up and how do we continue forward? And we do that with intention. And this concept of intention is one that's been really important in my entire life. And I gained some deeper knowledge and nuance, uh, sort of, I guess, the greater nuance of what the word intention meant after I moved to Japan. Um, I'm not, you know, big on Japanese. We have to use the Japanese words when we're doing, uh, we're practicing lean, but uh, having lived in Japan, I did appreciate learning some of the characters and how visual rep how visual symbols can rep represent um, deeper meaning in words. So I, I had to get bus business cards when I first moved to Japan. You know, you hand them out at every encounter, and I didn't have business cards. Having just started my company a year ago, a year before, I didn't have a logo, and you know, who needs business cards here in in the U.S. or in the West? So I asked the business card company to put the word for intention on my card. And this is these are the symbols that uh, represent the Japanese word for intention, shiko. And as I started to meet uh, Japanese people who spoke English, they would say, this is a very powerful word. And we agreed on this, but they would told, told me the nuance. So the symbol on the left is made up of two sub symbols. Then the one on the bottom means heart. And then the symbol on the right means direction. And I've really come to see this, uh, the word intention, having this deeper meaning of really connecting with our purpose, what's important inside of us, and how we align our behaviors and our actions with that. And so as we're thinking about being intentional people-centered leaders, we need to connect first with what's important to us um, as leaders or as people, and then what are the actions that are most aligned with demonstrating that purpose. So hold that with you here today as we go through. And again, I'm just going to be highlighting some very uh, sort of high level stories and points and would love to dive into this all with you more. And also the book will uh, go into this in a lot more detail. So looking forward to you seeing that next month when it releases. This concept of respect is fundamental and foundational to Toyota's culture. And again, this gets back to the concept of what people-centered leadership is about. It's about making people while we make our product or our service. So the, the concept of supporting and developing our people's capabilities is as important, if not more important, than the products or services we are, uh, we're delivering. And that's really how we demonstrate respect to, to our people and to our, and to our customers. And Mr. Yoshino, uh, you know, he always often asks, like, what's, what's Toyota's secret? I mean, we all want to know that. How have they been so successful? And 
we, uh, the visible tools are often what are uh, have been the main focus and what we sort of take in and try to replicate in, in our organizations. But he says that really the only secret to Toyota is its attitude towards learning. And that harkens to the back to the, the title of the book, Learning to Lead and then Leading to Learn. How do we not only uh, learn about leadership and about how to learn, but how do we then lead in a way that stimulates learning in our people, in our organizations, and in ourselves? So taking a step back uh, before I got to know Mr. Yoshino in Japan and, uh, and subsequently, I met him or saw, I first learned of him when I was at a conference in 2014. Actually, it was the Lean Coaching Summit hosted by Lean Frontiers and uh, LEI. And it was, it was an amazing opportunity. It was serendipity that Mr. Yoshino actually happened to be in Long Beach at the same time as the summit. And John Shook invited him to take the stage and them to share uh, some convert, some just talk about their experience as manager and subordinate. And I was sitting in the audience with the woman who was actually my coach and mentor who had invited me to co-present with her at the, at the Lean Coaching Summit. And we both looked at each other in sort of awe when we heard Mr. Yoshino say this comment that my aim as a manager was to develop John by giving him a mission or target and supporting him while he figured out how to reach the target. And as I was developing John, I was aware that I was developing myself as well. And this struck me as so profound and I've really taken uh, this to be the essence of what leadership is, the three roles, the three things that leaders need to do to really create a people-centered learning organization. It's setting the direction, providing the support, as well as developing yourself at the same time. So first, setting the direction. It is so important for leaders to take the responsibility to set the direction, to provide targets for their organization and for their teams. I was talking with Mr. Yoshino earlier today and he said, targets must come first. We can't create plans unless we know where we're going. Our strategies are the, the how we're gonna achieve the target, but we need to know what it is that we're doing. Um, it doesn't need to be precise, but it needs to give us a direction. I work with so many teams that uh, you know, the first thing they say is, well, we don't know what the target is. Well, then we have to spend a lot of time talking about uh, how they can come up with the target and help ha and ask their leaders about what is the direction that we need to go. So your role as a leader is to provide some sort of target to your people. And this target is allows us to have this check adjust. So it's okay to fail in, in on the quest of moving towards our target. So it's, perfection is not necessarily what we need to seek, but it's about the learning process that happens as well. Leaders also, in addition to setting the challenge and target, need to balance that with providing nurturing and support. So if we have just you know, pushing hard towards a challenge but not so adding the support, our teams won't succeed. And at the same time, if we're just nurturing and supporting, but not, not providing any direction of where to go, then we have maybe some activity and people feeling good, but not actually moving the organization forward. So how do we balance both these concepts of um, uh, direction and heart? So a leader can help provide support in many different ways. And this is the so much of the stories that are shared in the book, Leading to, Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn, our Mr. Yoshino's experience is about learning how to support other people for, uh, and then his way of demonstrating that support and development of others as well. So I'm going to share a few things with you here uh, today. And I love this quote from him that my role as a leader was to help others develop themselves. So we can't take we can't actually take on the responsibility of um, developing other people, but we can create the conditions and the support that allow them to learn. So a leader in providing support sets the conditions for someone to be successful and then also takes responsibility for when mistakes happen. Uh, and this is about how we create a culture in our organizations that where people are not a lot afraid of making mistakes because we inevitably are going to make mistakes. We're going to have failures. But how do we not blame the person for that, but take responsibility for setting those conditions? So there's one one story that I, I tell often, but it's really powerful uh, because I don't I can't imagine it happening in many organizations because uh, I just think we we often jump to blame rather than looking at the process. So in uh, Mr. Yoshino, who is actually young young Yoshino, 
He was about 22. He'd finished college and university and was just starting at Toyota. And he had a three month orientation program, two of which um, two months, even though he was in a back office role, were going to be uh, in the Gemba on the production plant floor and learning how to do the value creation work of the organization. And he was assigned to the paint shop in the Motomachi plant. And it was kind of a boring job. He had to pour in the solvent and the paint um, into this big tank that then one would mix it up and then you know, out this, the paint mixture would be sprayed on the cars as they came down the line. Well, one day after you know doing this for a few days, uh, someone, the, a manager came running in from the, the shop floor saying the paint wasn't sticking to about a hundred cars and they'd have to be repainted. And Yoshino, re when remembering the story for the first time in 30 years, he was laughing and, and laughing in appreciation for his manager's reaction because not only did they not yell at him, although I'm sure they were frustrated or he, know, he assumes that they were frustrated, but instead of starting to yell at him or being mad at him, they, they asked him to show them what he had done. And then they apologized. They said, we are sorry The you know, those paint cans actually looked very similar. We did not set up the work conditions such that it, you couldn't make a mistake. It's very easy that you made that mistake. We are sorry. And we are, uh, we appreciate you making that mistake because now we have an opportunity to improve uh, and maybe create the standard work. And I just, it really strikes me how different uh, a culture of uh, uh, that kind of, that kind of action and reaction that managers or leaders have or anyone has when a mistake is made. Not only not blaming, but then taking that responsibility for um, creating the conditions for people to be successful. So I think about how we can do more of that in our organizations as well. Also leaders have the responsibility of teaching the process of learning. So not necessarily telling everybody what to do and how to do it, so you need to set that direction, but then teaching them the process. So as leaders, we own creating the conditions for learning. So I think about how, uh, you know, how important it is to give people space to think. We're so used to everything being five alarm fires in our, in our organizations. And sometimes there is critical emergencies where we need to move quickly. But when we, when we really uh, treat everything, as something that has to be fixed now where we all just jump in and, and give our ideas and, and just move forward, we are really missing out on creating the capability for other people to learn. So how can we create space and give opportunities for people to go through the process of learning and the process of experimentation? And how as uh, leaders and managers and coaches in our organization, can we provide that support to help people as they get more uh, sophisticated or advanced in their problem-solving thinking. Also, I, I don't know about you, but I I worked in so many org worked for and in so many organizations where we focused way more on the tool than on the principle, and it's uh, sometimes getting too focused on what the template looks like or what the specific format is, uh, rather than the principles that under underlie it. I think especially around like A3 thinking or uh, any other tool or, or structure that's really there to help guide a thinking process um, or help help with a help achieve uh, a process improvement initiative. But when we are too worried about sticking to the exact format, uh, we sometimes miss that the opportunity to really be focused on the principle, which is around learning and around process improvement. So Yoshino was telling me a story just uh, the other day about how, this is in the book, but we were talking to another, another group about how he too was a little focused on the, on the, the structure and format of, of an A3 back in the 19, early 1980s when he was coaching a thousand managers on how to develop their strategy uh, documents on A3 paper. And he explained, exclaimed to his boss um, that somebody had, one of the, the managers hadn't didn't put a lot of words on his paper and it was pretty sparse. And his manager said, uh, this does not matter. As long as we can see his thinking, that's what matters most. It doesn't matter exactly how he filled it out and if it looks the same as other people. So I want us to take that principle back as well as like, how can we use tools to help guide a thinking process, but uh, that we're not too focused on what the, the specific tool looks like and um, be, being so rigid about the tool that we've, we miss the opportunity for developing the thinking. And also a leader's role is to develop ourselves. So we're helping other people 
learn to lead and we're leading to help them learn. Uh, and this requires us to never stop learning and growing ourselves. And to, to be humble enough to know that it's far better to know that we have to improve than to believe we know everything ourselves. I'm actually just writing an article about the concept of humility right now. I've been writing a series of articles on LinkedIn based on some of the concepts within the book and uh, learned from talking with Mr. Yoshino. And this concept of humility is so fundamental at Toyota and is one that we really need to embrace for ourselves about not believing we personally have all the answers and how can we create an organ environment where we are truly seeking out the input of others and leading with, yes, providing direction, but then asking questions to help people support and pull out their, their thinking as well. And this concept of failure isn't failure. Failure, if you learn something important you could have never have learned elsewhere, is really important too. Uh, and knowing that, you know, perfection, we may not always achieve perfection. In fact, we're probably never going to achieve perfection. But seeing uh, failures and mistakes and um, uh, not meeting our goals as a way to learn and improve and adjust. And this gets back to Toyota's, uh, what Mr. Yoshino believes is Toyota's uh, true secret sauce, which is its attitude towards learning. And that means the willingness to experiment, the willingness to fail, and the willingness to learn. And I've also come to uh, the conclusion for myself personally that developing others, so coaching others, leading others, and trying to do that more effectively is also a path to helping you develop your, yourself. I personally have had to work, uh, you know, and we all have opportunities for improvement and uh, had to put great intention towards becoming a better and more effective people-centered leader myself. And I want to now share with you three things that I have found very helpful for myself and that I coach other people as well as they are looking to improve themselves as coaches and as leaders. So this goes back, the first is what I call taking an intention pause. And this is going back to this concept of intention. And how do you take just a few moments between interactions to reconnect with what is my purpose in that interaction or in that situation? And then how do I best align my actions to achieve that purpose? We are running from Zoom to Zoom, meeting to meeting, uh, encounter to encounter, and our role sometimes needs to switch between what uh, sort of purpose we're, we're uh, our, what our purpose is in each of those meetings or encounters. Sometimes we are the leader who needs to set the direction to tell, and then we need to be showing up in a more directive type of way. Other times we're there to be doing, we're conducting a one-on-one -on -one with someone who reports to us, or we are facilitating a team session or a group meeting where our role, our purpose is not to be the one who has all the answers, but to help facilitate the uh, ideas to come forward from our, from our team members that we're working with. In that case, aligning our actions means asking more questions or knowing when people are feeling stuck and then maybe stepping into more of a teaching role. So grounding ourselves in that purpose and knowing how you're going to uh, sort of the, the, the behaviors and habits you're going to show up with can be tremendously helpful. I also want you to pay attention to the quality of your questions. This is a funny looking slide. It is a uh, wolf dressed up as a sheep. And it's amazing. Once you start paying attention to how, how you and others ask questions, you'll be surprised potentially at how many leading questions and prompting questions we ask. These are the, the closed ended questions um, that are, could be answered in yes or no or the multiple choice or the really dis, uh, wolf in sheep's clothing, the what if you tried my great idea. These are questions that sound like humble inquiry questions, but in fact are your ideas with a question mark on it. You're offering advice, you're creating suggestions. This is not necessarily bad to be offering advice at times, but don't disguise it as a question. Label it as an advice and, um, and let people know that. So don't ask fake questions and don't trick yourself into thinking that you're asking questions when you're really um, giving ideas. So uh, a way to help think about these, uh, a different type of question to ask are asking questions that start with what or how. And again, they can be disguised as um, these, these fake questions, but if you ask a question starting with what, what or how, you're more likely to be asking a true open-ended question that's 
asked with the intention of helping somebody else think or bring forward their ideas. And the corollary of asking questions is listening openly. I have found for myself so many times that I uh, end up listening to my own voice inside my head rather than what the other person is saying. And I have to put great intention and focus to really staying connected and listen to what the other person is saying. These are drawings that my friend Karen Ross made for our Katie and Karen coaching communities, K2C2. And it's a way to talk about how do we open, listen, uh, listen openly, but not just with our ears, but with our eyes. How can we see what's going on, um, observe the, the subtle cues that may not come forward just through ears? How do we listen with an open mind? How do we check our assumptions and really hear what somebody's saying? And how do we listen with an open heart? So really being open to what that person is saying um, from their whole experience. So uh, this concept of listening is so important as well. And something that I've also come to really believe that learning is never perfect and it's never complete. And I would say that writing a book is the same way. I'm in multiple uh, PDCA revision cycles and I'm, on, I'm towards the end. The book's gonna come out in a few weeks and it will be uh, imperfect but it will be uh, and never complete, but it will it'll be there and out there for you. And I'm really excited for that. So I want you to set your intention uh, for yourself about one thing that you are going to practice with intention to improve as a people centered leader and to write down for yourself that one thing. And what is your plan? How are you going to connect with that intention? And what is what are the actions you are going to take to fulfill that intention? And I'm gonna lead you, leave you here um, with some of my contact information as well. So Mr. Yoshino and I had um, been planning on going, going to the AME Toronto conference. Um, it's unlikely that if it's in person, he'll be able to attend, uh, but we will figure out a way to participate and uh, we'll be sharing more stories and practices, uh, both from Mr. Yoshino's experiences, but from mine as well. And I'm really excited that the book will be uh, available next month, the pre-order, is available now on Amazon. The paperback is available for pre-order in the US. Um, unfortunately, not available for free to order outside the US, but will be available once the book releases next month. And then the ebook's available for pre-order now. And I also want to um, offer up a coaching questions guide for you. I, Duane will put this in the, in the uh, follow-up email as well, but you can register for a four-page coaching questions guide to help you think about the quality of the questions that you're asking and how you can show up with more intention to be a people-centered leader. So thank you so much. And it's it feels so strange and unidirectional um, for me to just be talking at you for um, a half an hour, but I hope you've taken at least one thing away that you can practice with intention. And I look forward to hearing from you all and, um, and uh, thank you in advance for your interest in the book. And I'm excited to be offering it out into the world. So thanks, Duane, for hosting us today. Yeah, Katie, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for not only your time here, but thanks for your thought leadership over the years. And you mentioned the uh, Lean Coaching Summit specifically. You've been you've certainly been an important voice in that community. And I really appreciate your your contributions there as well. You, thank you. you mentioned uh, it was at the Lean Coaching Summit that you met Mr. Yoshino. Um, I was there uh, in that same audience. and was really moved by the relationship that the two of them had. Yes. Um, a relationship of respect, um, just a very deep relationship that came out of that work work relationship. Right. So it it's really cool. special. And John Shook's written the foreword for the book, and he has generously um, allowed me to publish many of his photos. Mr. Yoshino had no photos. Um, so there's some great photographs of them playing banjo and guitar together and some other um, things that will be included in the book. So that's uh, that's been really fun to uh, to go through with John and with Mr. Yoshino. Well, that's great. Very much looking forward to uh, getting a copy of the book and um, congratulations on all the work you've put in up uh, up to this point. So thank you, Dwayne. I'll be getting yeah. back to the edits uh, later today. Yep. Um, so I'm looking forward to uh, to seeing uh, you, Katie, and then uh, hopefully everyone else, either in person in Toronto or online, uh, if that's the direction that AME takes uh, this October. 
Uh, stay tuned uh, as AME continues to refine their plans for this fall. Uh, you, you can visit ame.org uh, for more information and uh, certainly check back often. So as mentioned earlier, you'll receive an email uh, shortly with a link to the recording. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, please do share this with others in your organization. So thanks again, Katie, and thanks to everyone who participated in today's webinar. Have a great day and now go do good things.